you get plenty of coverage of Oklahoma State football. You think you hear all the noise coming from Gallagher Iba Arena when you get your Cowboy basketball news. But you don't. You just don't get it, do you? You don't. And there's a couple of Jordans here to fix just that. This is the Cowgirl Coverage Podcast. This could be a podcast. Anyone with a computer can make one. And here are your hosts, Jordan Keene and Jordan Bishop. Welcome back into the Cowgirl Coverage Podcast, Triple Play Podcast Network, Jordan to Jordan. And how about this? Two episodes in one week. I'm going to say that now, and I'm going to make sure it gets done. We just uploaded Elise Hahn. We uploaded it. We're recording this Wednesday. This will get posted Thursday. I promise you that is the case. Uh, and, and again, we uploaded Elise. That was like two weeks late. I apologize for that. That's Jordan King's fault, who you're listening to right now. We got Jordan Bishop with me, as always. And uh, Jordan, we're finally back. They're not get, this one's not going to include an interview or anything, but uh, we need to get people updated on the fall that has been over the last three weeks or so for Cowgirl Sports. Yeah, I took a vacation last week, too, so it's on me as well. I mean, we could have come in here last week and done something that I was off. With my family, I know I should have been here with the podcast. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's it's been a very busy couple of weeks that we haven't updated you on. So we're gonna talk to you all about that. It cut deep when Sam Henderson yesterday said, "Hey, are you guys still doing that podcast?" I was like, "Yep, yep. This is I deserve that. I deserve that." So uh, there you go. Um, good stuff there. We'll get into some basketball. That's where uh, I saw Sam Henderson yesterday, and Cowgirls playing pretty well to start off the season. But you have to start off, Jordan, with the Cowgirl soccer team. Again, Elise Hahn, appreciate her taking out a few minutes and joining us a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that was right in the midst of the Big 12 tournament run. Unlucky bounce. They lose to, to Kansas, which is probably why they're headed to L.A. today rather than just cozying in at Neil Patterson Stadium. That was probably the difference that forced them from a three to a two seed, or a two to a three seed. But uh, nonetheless, they're taking on a really tough Santa Clara squad. And then uh, if they win that, and again, that's kind of jumping ahead of things. Um, but if they're able to do that, get to the Sweet 16, you're talking about either USC and Coach Carmichael pointed out to Tom Dorado earlier this week, you can't rule out Texas A&M because that's a really good squad too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and Santa Clara is a squad that we didn't know about until we talked to Coach Carmichael yesterday. They're a good squad. They're a national championship pedigree team. Uh, they have a lot of good players. They're top ten scoring offense in the nation, so it's going to be tough to contain that offense. They can score from any position. So that whole regional over there is pretty good. Uh, Oklahoma State, Santa Clara, USC, and A&M are all teams that can make it to the Final Four. Yeah, it's it. And, and again, this is I, I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now. This is the case. I mean, uh, in some cases, the round of 64 is this way. I mean, you saw South Dakota State uh, 114th in the RPI, and they stood a, a real test to Oklahoma State just simply because that's how soccer is. Play good defense, you, you're going to be in every single game. And thankfully, Oklahoma State able to get that done, move on to the round of 32. But from here on out, got to get a bounce, got to get a call. Got to be really, really good on top of all that stuff. And sometimes it's just luck that, that advances you on to the next round, too. Yeah, definitely. And uh, there's one team that you're showing a score for. I know they've been on top of the rankings all year long in Stanford. And their first win, 15 to nothing over Prairie View AM. They're the team to beat right now for the rest of the country looking at. But hey, like you mentioned, yeah, it's 15 nothing in that game. But the next game, they could lose. You know, if the, if the ball bounces your way, if you have the luck of whatever is playing that day, if you, there's a certain wind gust that comes in at the right moment, anything can happen in soccer. And that's what's so great about the game. Yeah, it's so fun. And, uh, again, a lot of good games, that matches that will be going on this weekend. Uh, I'll also have my mind out in, in L.A. on a different regional. That is uh, that is Wisconsin, the three, another one of the three seeds, very similar to Oklahoma State in terms of RPI and in the United Soccer Coaches poll. They've been ranked right next to each other, so I was kind of hoping they'd end up in the same same side of things. But uh, you know, it would take a national championship matchup between those two. In which case, I would completely—I don't know what I would do. Uh, so let's just say that. Uh, but they take on Duke. Uh, they're at UCLA, obviously Oklahoma State at USC. So talking about USC for just a second, and then we'll get into Santa Clara and some of the results they've had over the course of the season. We know they beat Cal. Cal's a really good team. Cal beat USC earlier in the year. And now Santa Clara beat Cal. So, I mean, the, the, you, Cal or Santa Clara is a team that can beat Oklahoma State. There's no doubt about that. And we'll get to them in just a second. But USC, this is a team that earlier on in the season, Jordan, went on the road to Baylor, a team that Oklahoma State, you know, Baylor didn't even make the tournament, and they tied at Baylor. So, this, again, just to accentuate how close it is between a top eight team, top ten team, to a Baylor team, which is somewhere in the 40s, generally speaking, in the RPI. 
Yeah, definitely. And how close they are to Oklahoma State. You mentioned that if OSU would have beat Kansas, they probably would have been hosting being a 2 UC because Oklahoma State only had one loss going into that. They had three ties. And, you know, USC is about the same record-wise. So it just all comes down to certain games. But that's a good sign for the Cowgirls that, hey, we have a common opponent in Baylor. Um, you have some tape on them you can watch. But the Cowgirls aren't overlooking Santa Clara, though, Friday. They want to, of course, win the whole weekend, but you can't overlook the first game if you want to win the second game. And how about Santa Clara? This is a team that has played one of the tougher schedules you'll find in the country. They lost to Texas A&M, and uh, going back to August, they also played Wake Forest. That's a top team in the country. They played Duke at Duke, lost to them 3-2 to two in overtime. They knocked off UCLA. We just talked about UCLA. They're hosting Jordan. They're, they're one of the, the host sites um, in, in a two-seed in this tournament. They lost to Cal, and then obviously they uh, remedied that. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, or a couple of days ago, in the uh, tournament. And then you go back to the BYU game. BYU, we know, is undefeated on the season, only has four ties. One of the ties is against Santa Clara. So you look at Santa Clara, it's a team that was just inconsistent enough not to make it into uh, you know into a, uh, into a seated position, um, but still a really quality team. Stanford is their biggest loss on the season with a two-goal loss, four to two. So you understand that, this team can score with the best of them, and you look across the board, there is not many games, if any, that Santa Clara, no, they haven't played a game yet this year where they've failed to score a goal. Yeah, yeah, and that's what Coach Carmichael talked about yesterday, that scoring offense, and we talked a little bit with Olivia Dowell about how it's kind of like the Penn State matchup they had back in September, that the Calgary's been working on controlling the ball. they got to work on you know keeping possession for them, for them keeping it out of Santa Clara's uh, feet, because if they do – then you have a better chance of winning the game. Um, I know it sounds pretty easy, like, oh, yeah, of course, we have the ball, then they can't score. But it's a lot harder with a team that scores from every position like that Santa Clara does. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. So a really tough game there. Uh, and, again, Texas A&M is another good team. Um, we won't go necessarily go through their schedule. But, uh, you know, if, if they end up playing uh, Texas A&M on, on that Sunday match, Jordan, out there in, in, in Southern Cal, uh, again, at, at the campus of USC, if they end up playing them out there, I mean – you just look at what Texas A&M has done. They beat Texas 4-1. to one. And so you understand Texas A&M is no slouch either. This is a team that feels like they could make a run to the Elite Eight or Final Four as well. So, uh, again, this just kind of highlights the point I've been making the whole time is I think it's really tough from here on out. It's, it's kind of nip and tuck, so to speak. And unless you're playing the Stanfords of the world or maybe a North Carolina, which Oklahoma State could potentially set up a matchup with to go to the Final Four, anyone can beat anyone at this point. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, like we talked with Danny Greenlee yesterday, she talked about how it'd be nice to get this program back up to historic heights. I mean, they made back-to-back elite eights in 2010, 2011 with AD French. It's possible. I mean, it's possible to make it there. I mean, either this weekend, you're in the elite eight. So that's how big that is. Um, of course, it's going to be tough, tough path, but every game is tough in the tournament right now, especially in the round of 32. Yeah, no doubt about it. And again, you mentioned uh, Danny and and Grace Yoakum said, "Let's go make." That's her been her thing all season long. Let's make history. That's what Danny told us. Uh, that Grace said that Grace could be a an X factor. We'll see. I we didn't hear that she was back, so I would assume she's probably going to be out for Friday. I know it's kind of week to week with her, but if they can somehow get her back, maybe win a couple games this weekend, and that'd be that'd be a heck of a of a player to get back when North Carolina comes rolling around. If again, we're putting card ahead of the horse here, but again, that w- I mean. It's almost like getting a free agent acquisition late in the year. Yeah, it is like getting a free agent. It's like getting a replacement player, you know, or reinforcements at the right time. And that's somebody who I think, you know, could have been and playing for Big 12 Player of the Year. I know she had a lot of goals. She came on, you know, clutch the moments. She was right there in the running that she got hurt at the end of the season. So if you have her back and she brings a lot intangibles off the field as well as a leader, that's going to be great for you and your team. So good stuff there, Cowgirl Soccer, uh, 11 o'clock local time. Here in central time frame, you're looking at a 1 o'clock start. Perfect time frame. I get done producing Robert's show at 1. I go on at 3. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I don't know what I'm going to have to do, what network I'm going to have to sign up for, how much money I'm going to have to pay, but I'm going to be watching that game, believe you me. Let's move on to some tennis, Jordan, uh, some good rankings to close out the uh, season. Won't spend a ton of time, but uh, uh, some good runs through the ITA National Championships out there uh, in Newport Beach, California, sending a lot of teams out out west. But Lisa Marie Ryu has been terrific um, in, in the preseason. She was, I believe, 43, somewhere around there. 
she rises up to number 16 in the country. She's going to be that number one, almost like, you know, we kind of thought that she might be, um, and she's playing really, really well through through the fall. Bunyawi Tumchaiwat, hard to believe she's only a sophomore, um, but, uh, you know, she, she comes from 67 up to 29, so two players in the top 30 did not have that last year in terms of signal, singles, uh, even to end it. And then Ayumi Miyamoto is number 92. And again, Jordan, you go back to last season, Lisa Marie Ryu was your number two, and she was just cracking the top 90 at the end of the season. Here you're starting the season with three just about inside the top 90. Yeah, and this is just goes into the Chris Young, you know, pedigree. Basically, you know, it's it's the way it's been it's been, and that's the thing about these rankings is you may be thinking, oh, it's the fall. No, these are the rankings of the year end of the fall. They're going to be used for the preseason for the spring, which sets up a lot of preseason team rankings, which is what all teams look at whenever they have the tournaments. So this is great, important stuff for the Cowgirls, especially individually, and then they also have some doubles players too that that have some rankings as well. So this is good, uh, good for the confidence as well, and then. Honestly, a great showing out. Um, I know they had, I think, Lisa and Binyawe, uh won the, won, won the regional title in doubles, so that's good confidence for them going forward. Yeah, um, it was uh, well, Miyamoto and, and Ryu, uh, but Ayumi Miyamoto, I mean, look at that. This is a freshman, George, and, and I mean, she's, been, she's been really, really terrific. But Miyamoto and Ryu, they're number 17 in doubles and uh, were unranked going into doubles. Again, going into the, into the fall, Jordan, you had the doubles team – uh, of Catherine Gulliher and Alana Wolfberg. That's a sophomore-freshman tandem. They were ranked number 29. They're no longer ranked in doubles, but you had your two unranked doubles teams, Jordan, yeah. now ranked. Uh, you have Yumi Miyamoto and Lisa Marie Ryu. They're up to 17. And then Daria Detkovskaya, who's been terrific, by the way, uh, in singles as well. She's probably flirting with the top 100, uh, you know, being ranked in singles as well. Um, but she's known for her doubles, and her and Bunyawi Tumchaiwat have been so good. They're into the top 40 at number 39 in doubles rankings as well. So, we know what we we will beat the dead horse, man. I mean, Chris, Chris Young doubles point looks like this year he's got a lineup, and we're not even talking about the recruit that they're they're getting in that they just signed last week. I mean, this is a pretty bulletproof doubles uh, lineup when you talk about Miyamoto Ryu number seventeen, Dekovskaya Tamchaiwat thirty nine, and then a team that was ranked previously in the fall but is not ranked anymore in Alana Wolfberg and Catherine Gull- Catherine Gulliher. Yeah, and, and Catherine Gulliher, uh, to me, is one of the best players I watched uh, as a freshman last year. She's a sophomore, and she's one of your unranked players. That's a big deal for you as a team. And Alana Wolfhard coming in here as one of the top players in the nation. And the one you mentioned coming in that they, get, they just signed, I know Chris has kind of hinted at it you know, throughout the fall. He hasn't really – I don't think he's allowed to say it, but now he is because she signed as Linka Stara, and she's from Slovakia. She's only 19. And listen to this. This is what amazed me about this. Only 19 years old. She already has 73 single wins. 73 single wins at 19 years old. That's insane. I mean, she's probably playing, you know, professionally these matches when she was 11 or 12. So that's great. She has a lot of experience for herself. She's coming in here for the spring season. So she's going to be coming right there and battling for position in that top six. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I know Coach Young talked uh, with Jason and I on air uh, when it happened and said, this girl is from Slo- Slovakia. Thank Thank goodness we had uh, Katarina Streznikova. She was a big part uh, in helping recruit her because, again, you know, this is a player with the quality to probably go pro right now at 19 years old. And maybe it was it was Katie who said, "No, look, you can come here, play a year or two in college, maybe four years. I mean, hopefully four. But, you know, play a couple of years in college, and you can still have a pro life after that. And then, obviously, the pl- – the current pro players that CY has in the pros, that also helps. Yeah, and, and the thing I think about when I talk to all these players about, when we talked with Sofia Blanco about it last year, going either to college or coming to play pro immediately, and a lot of them talked about the opportunities that, you know, at most foreign countries there's only one university they're all harder to get into, so it's easier to get a college education here in America. But also the fact that on the playing court you're going against a lot of women that are also playing professional tournaments in the, in the summertime as as you as are you we saw that in this in this summer um up at kansas so you're going against professional type players you're still staying in staying in, sh- staying in shape you're not going against lesser players so even if you do want to go to the wtas after this you're gonna be ready to go yeah there's no doubt about it by the way I saw on Twitter today it's Sofia Blanco's birthday. So we're recording this on Wednesday, uh, November 20th. Uh, if you're listening to this, Sofia, happy birthday. 
There you go. So some good stuff there on the women's tennis front. Real quick on equestrian, we'll just mention this in, in passing. It probably deserves more time than this, but they're up to number two in the in the uh, country in the NCEA Farnham poll. And, uh, again, their only loss comes to number one at the time, Auburn. And then, well, two losses, pardon me. They lost to Auburn and then lost to Fresno State. Fresno State, one of the satellite members of the Big 12 Conference now. So sitting at top of the Big 12 Conference, tied with Fresno State at 2-1. and one. Baylor and TCU, both really quality teams. Both those teams are top 10 teams nationally in the Big 12, and they're both sitting at 1-2 and two saying, we're, we're, we're sitting here at the bottom of the conference, but we're still a top 10 team in the country. So the Big 12, very strong, as you would expect, in equestrian, and Oklahoma State just continues to roll uh, in terms of, of the, the pedigree that they have. Seems like every month they have National Riders of the Month. And then Jordan, they just signed and announced their recruiting class, 10 different riders, seven different states, and one from the Netherlands as well. Yeah, you know, when we talked to Larry Sanchez last spring, he mentioned that last fall, so fall of 2018, was a bit of rebuilding time. We saw that in the record, and they came on in the spring, and they made a run through nationals. And he mentioned that that was going to be, that rebuilding time last year was the kind of, I don't know, the, the building blocks it's, it's taken to get to here, and it's going to be really good from here on out. And I'm not saying it was bad before then, but it just took a little bit of a dip, and now it's on its way back up there in the strategery. So I think it's great that uh, they're, they're doing well. they got a great recruiting class coming in here. Fall, the fall season is closing up right now, so you're going to be at number two. Hopefully you'll stay around that for the spring rankings come out there. They might shift a little bit, but being locked in there right now at the end of this fall has to be making you feel pretty good if you're Larry Sanchez. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, and they've played really, really well. Played, wrote, whatever. Uh, they, they've they competed uh, extremely well on that side of things. Really quickly, uh, cross-country, Jordan, uh, two individuals go. A little bit disappointing. I, You know, it, it it's you have to say it's disappointing because you were hosting the regionals. Neither team sends the entire team. Men's don't, men don't send even any individuals. Uh, but on the women's side, obviously you're sending uh, Molly Bourne and Taylor Somers, both of those two uh, terrific uh, Bourne top two. She's an automatic qualifier. Uh, Taylor Somers ends up being a, uh, an at-large bid. And uh, sending two individuals is important as well. If you're not going to get there as a team, uh, you want to be a, at least – putting some great runners out there, and that's what uh, what Coach Smith has been able to do. Yeah, I know Coach Smith, he wasn't very happy with uh, the way it was. And he mentioned it's because also the, the the focus being on him, them hosting that. I think, though, if you're him, to think about, I know it's hard, but to try to be kind of the uh, the showman type, you know, Chris Young, Kenny Gajewski, these type of coaches, they do the showmanship type of off the field because if you're Dave Smith, look at this. You had a big crowd coming in here. This is basically, to me, what I thought as being a run through for when you host nationals next year. Is this hosting this regional, seeing how it works, you know, the whole, you know, the whole new course looks and how people react to it. I think it was a success last week, and for that wise, you have to do some stuff working on your team. But looking at how the course looks and how people are excited about your program, you're gonna be pretty uh, looking pretty good for Dave Smith and thinking about okay. Yes, we have to work on a product on the on the course, but people are actually excited now. We're going to be hosting this next year. We've got some big buzz about it now. Yeah, no doubt about it. Isabella Fierro on the women's golf team making some waves. Uh, she was named as one of the uh, the Annika Award watch list players for one of the best players in the, the country uh, as just a freshman. We've talked about this lineup up and down. They completed their spring se- or their fall season of, you know, about close to a month ago. I think we talked about that a little bit, but uh, – Isabella Fierro has been terrific, and uh, she even posted something on Twitter last night, a trick shot that was yeah. unbelievable, um, and she's uh, she looks like she's the re- real deal uh, in terms of uh, of the next great cowgirl golfer. Yeah, definitely, and she's a great follow on social media if you want to because she has stuff like that all the time, and she is just – you mentioned that um, – uh, Lincoln Star could have gone pro at 19. Isabel Fierro could have gone pro last year. Uh, kudos to Coach Robertson to bring, for bringing her in, bringing this great class in. Like I mentioned to you, I guess throughout the whole week last week, men's golf might be the – I won't say worse because they're gonna be they're gonna be a tournament team. They might make a run for a national title. Who knows? But they might be the least successful of the spring sports next year because there's so much good teams coming in there, especially uh, women's golf. Um, Equestrian's gonna be good. Softball's gonna be good. Women's tennis is gonna host the nationals and probably gonna be there. Baseball's gonna be good. So it's gonna be a very exciting time to be Oklahoma State fan. There's the there's the gauntlet. There's the gauntlet, Coach Bratton, thrown down by Jordan Bishop. Uh, but, no, I mean, like you said, um, even if they end up being, quote, unquote, the worst, 
like you said, they may still compete for a national championship. So that's just the uh, the nature of the beast. Speaking of softball, Cowgirl softball, you see it on Twitter. You see the videos. The culture, the Kenny Gajewski culture is there, Jordan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like I, I know I, I covered him since he got here. It feels like forever ago since he got here. It, it, it feels like he's built, like he's been an entrenched coach now. There's no more of those, oh, he's been here for two or three years, kind of what's it like to change the culture. The culture is his, and he's built such an excitement around the program. That's why I mentioned the showmanship earlier that I was talking about. He has built something there over at Calgary Stadium at the corner of Duckham and McElroy that I really love, you know, and, and I think – uh, you know, seeing the tweets, you know, I know our good friend John Lingham's down there, but Andy Chang's doing a good job on social media as well, keeping up that kind of excitement and buzz about the program. Because I think, honestly, everybody talks about Mike Boynton on the men's side, which they should, but Kenny Gaiessi's right out there with promoting his program. Yeah, no, no doubt about that, Jordan. And again, I, I forget what what the quote was they used when they posted their video of weightlifting today, but it's uh, champion sacrifice and stuff like that. And these are the words that we heard last year. From Sam Shaw, from uh, from uh, Maddie C. Montgomery, from Riley Bayless. These these are the words that they've used, and I think that means the program. I mean, look, culture's here, and and I think that's that's what that means. So, uh, good good stuff there on the softball side of things. How about basketball, Jordan? Um, just scrolling through here. Uh, there's Lauren Fields uh, on on social media. She was, uh, I believe, on the uh, the broadcast with Casey and the crew. On the network, I believe she was the player of the game uh, for them last night. You look at the the, the uh, points lines, and you realize Natasha Mack has 19, and uh, Vivian Gray has 17, but the, and and then you know just 13 from from Lauren Fields. But then you look five or four steals, five assists, and no turnovers from a freshman. That this is, I mean, Lauren Fields looks like maybe she's third or fourth in terms of the pecking order, and. This is kind of ever since you started covering this, certainly since I've started covering this, it's been, all right, you have number one and number two. Who's going to be number three? Yeah. Well, now maybe it's you have number one and number two. Maybe you have three and four now with uh, Jamie Asbury getting in on the action. She scored 21 points over in Tulsa. Lauren Fields has done a great job forcing her way into the starting lineup as a freshman. And then you're one and two. It may be as good as you've ever had it uh, in terms of, and again, I don't want to speak for the Tiffany bias days and, and those kinds of things, but Vivian Gray, is a, she can fill it up. And then Natasha Mack is, is one of the better rebounders I think that Co- Coach Littell's ever had. Yeah, and, and that's what we talk about. We haven't made a uh, mistake about, you know, talking about the death problems they've had on this team. And, and you know, the, for a while, it was a couple of years, okay, we had two, we had a big two, you know, Kaylee Jensen, we have Warren Goodwin, we have Braxton Miller, we have Evan Gray. But you couldn't ever find depth outside of them. And there's always looking for that number three, and sometimes you're looking for the number two if someone's having a bad night or going to foul trouble. So now you have two definite players, and it helps you kind of round out some people. And the one thing you mentioned there, Jordan, the big number is zero. Zero turnovers for a freshman in Warren Fields, because that's a problem they've had, not just freshmen, for <laughs> players of any grade. They've had problems with turnovers the past couple of years, and that's, you know, a big, big you know, point that Coach will tell has been talking about. So that you're playing cleaner basketball. I know it wasn't pretty at points last night, but hey, it was your fourth game of the season. It's not going to be pretty. Um, you're going to be roughed up here in a couple of weeks. You're playing some tough teams, but you're going to be better off for it once conference season hits. And I think right now, if you're developing these younger players and hopefully getting some depth uh, built, it'll be better for you come February, which has been a struggling month for the past couple of years. How about this, Jordan? Last two games, 49 second half points against Tulsa. Meanwhile, giving up nine second half yeah. points. And then 40 second half points against uh, the team that you played last night in Idaho State. Those are some pretty good second halves. But Coach Littell, he said, someone asked him, you know, Coach, your second halves have been really good. And he said, I think that's a polite way to say we've sucked in the first half. So he's not resting on his laurels. They got to start better if you play against a a Baylor or an Iowa State or a, a Kansas State, quite frankly, or a TCU even in Oklahoma this year, who looks to be bouncing back um, with their program here, here this this season, uh, can have slow starts in, in the Big 12, Jordan. Yeah, and you remember last year, Jordan, I'm not going to say this has been a problem throughout his era, because it's not. It's just been a problem with the past couple of years. Actually, just this year, or I, last year. I can't get my years right. But last year, definitely, during that season, I know it was you know one that a lot of people want to forget, but they're coming out there in the first five minutes or so it'd be all times coach will talk them in there after the game and say that it was awful. You know, in the first five minutes they came out there, they looked like they were asleep. They couldn't get any energy going. So it's good. They're having some energy coming out the gate. I know it's not, you know, the perfect way he wants it, 
but you're coming out there with some more energy and not looking as lackadaisical as you were last year. Because last year, that's was kind of put the emphasis on the third quarter and have to try and make a, something out of that because your first half was so bad. So now it's at least decent. You get something to build on. Yeah, got to be better in, in that regard. But, uh, yeah, second halves have been unbelievable so far this season. I think we've hit everything, Jordan. Uh, good good job by us. I'm. Let's see what, what – yeah, 25 minutes? That's not bad. That is not bad compared to some of our uh, <laughs> our other rumbling ramblings on. Well, there you go. Um, about half hour ago, Cowgirl Soccer posted photos from the beach, Jordan. Venice Beach, and we asked uh, – I think it was Danny Greenlee. <laughs> if we, so we asked Coach Carmichael, like, you know, any hot spots? He's like, I'm too old for hot spots. But we asked Danny Greenlee, and she said, well, hopefully they run into a celebrity. She's hoping maybe they can run into Kate Middleton. Um, but then she wouldn't be playing the game, though. She was just playing around Princess Kate the whole time. So, But if they ran into Kate Middleton, that would be a heck of a story. <laughs> no doubt about it. Good stuff for them. Uh, they've earned a trip like this and uh, playing really, really well. And I know the other thing uh, that Danny Greenlee said is, She's happy. She's like, I, I, you know, if we're not going to play here at Neil Patterson Stadium, give me warm weather. I don't want to go play somewhere where it's cold. So uh, congratulations to the Cowgirls. They get to take a trip out to uh, to California, out to Los Angeles, check out Venice Beach. Good for them. I think that's going to wrap things up, yeah. Jordan. This is episode 37. Yep, yep. Catch them back up. And then, you know, soccer keeps on this run. We'll be there next week. Hopefully we'll have another interview for you guys. Um, and then we're going to try to get into some basketball, and we'll have come full circle. Full circle the whole this whole year. Yeah, how about that? That'll be good stuff. I know I'm probably gonna head over to try to go talk to uh, basketball maybe Friday after practice and go see, just uh, go see what's up oh, uh, over there with the the women's basketball team. They've had a good start to the season. Got Rice this weekend. Then as you mentioned, Jordan, number one Oregon, number eight Louisville, tough UT Arlington squad. By the way, all that crap is on Flow Sports. Unbelievable. Why is it not on actual cable? That's if. If you're going to have the Maui Gym Invitational there, and this is up that copper. What can be top ten teams you have playing in this in this uh, tournament down there in the Virgin Islands? And it's going to be on Flow Sports. I know John Smith's a big advocate for Flow Sports. He's the only one. Because I'd rather it be on ESPN Plus or actually something you can get without having to pay $100 just to watch a single game. Yeah, yeah. so crazy stuff there. Hey, appreciate you guys tuning in for episode 37. Appreciate all the support as well. We've... Uh, We've seen some really incredible numbers over the past couple of weeks and couple of months, and we appreciate that. And we appreciate uh, uh, certainly Wade McWhorter with uh, with soccer because he's done a great job, and all the soccer players sound like they're enjoying it. That uh, at least from the Elise interview, it's spreading around the clubhouse. They're uh, they they're talking about us, I guess. So whether that's good or bad. Uh, they'll never tell us. So anyways, we got to get out of here. This is episode 37 and it's in the books and we appreciate you tuning in to the cowgirl coverage podcast, triple play podcast network.